Good. Welcome to Brain Tech Support Live. Um, I have the camera set up on a uh, like plant. There's a, a giant plant. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, we're kind of in the jungle. So I think it'll stay. It's also the tripod set up down in the dirt. Uh, but I think I think we're okay. We'll, so we'll get going. Since we'll we'll be talking about uh, today, uh, just loving plants. This is a good plant. It's doing a really good job of being a plant. It's a real plant too. In my room, there's a fake plant, but I still talk to it sometimes. Also, as we often do on Brain Tech Support Live, we'll talk about doing the things we want to do in life while carrying around uh, a human brain. Oh, Bogos, Binte, I hope your day is, is treating you well. So you have uh, questions you want to share, feel free to. Feel free to share the questions. And we'll, yeah, explore them. Thanks for joining us today. And of course, yeah, anybody uh, who's joining for our live session, thank you for dropping on by. I appreciate you being here today. And feel free to share anything you want to share. Um, especially, <laughs> I, I have a tendency to fall behind on the chat. Or not fall behind. It doesn't feel like falling behind. It feels like we have a good conversation and I'll catch up to the conversation. But because of that, if you have a question, it helps uh, to ask the question uh, more than just posting like a topic. Because uh, uh, if it's just a topic, hmm, I probably won't have any particular thoughts on it. DK, hello. I hope you're having a good day. Faisal, welcome. Bogos. Ah, so, yeah, Bogos, the, uh, so I'll show you your question here. It comes up a lot. He said, I remember you saying on a previous stream, if you had any book recommendations on anxiety, I didn't mean a book that would feed my anxiety, but a book that would help me build healthy habits, build high self-esteem. So the thing that I always recommend to people, especially if, so if you've already read a book, so this comes a lot, say for instance, for example, somebody read uh, my book on mental health, so You Are Not a Rock, The Mind Workout, and Trying to Do Mente, whatever you know, language you read it in. After that, what I suggest people do, and so it could be another book on mental health as well, uh, is because, so you mentioned something that's a perfect example of this, because working on something like self-esteem isn't something we'll work on separate from our life. We can't like sit at home building self-esteem. That's not going to happen. We're going to build self-esteem through giving ourselves trust, through doing the things we want to do in life. And we're going to do that out in the world, doing the things we want to do. So what I always suggest to people, after you've read a book on mental health, could be somebody else's book too, then it's time to get a book on something you want to be doing more of in life. So often when people send me, say, a message asking for book recommendations, I'll often ask them, uh, like, what kind of food do they like? And then I'll send them a cookbook recommendation on <laughs> that kind of food they like. Uh, because, yeah, cooking can be a great way to uh, nourish ourselves and care for ourselves. And building self-esteem, taking ourselves where we want to go in life is going to be about actions. So finding a book that's going to help with those actions that you want to be doing more of in life. The, the plant is going to join us in the stream here. So yeah, Bogus, have fun finding a book that's going to be about the things you want to be doing more of in life. So Abjot, welcome. j and M. Faisa, thank you. Annie, welcome. Hi, oh, hey. All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining. JNM, 
said, why do obsessions and the urge to do a compulsions get so strong at the times you most need to be away from them? For example, during a conversation, should you just disregard? Um, so, the reason, so first up to the first question, the reason they get so strong is because they are kind of indicating to you that there is a lot of uncertainty there. So when you said it, like, why do they get so strong at the times you know most need to be away from them? But it's that belief that you need to be away from them, which is making them intense. Right? When we say, oh, these, these experiences can't be here right now because I want to control the uncertainty in this conversation. It's that desire to control the uncertainty in the conversation which we don't control, that then gets the brain throwing up things for you to control. So welcoming any kind of intrusive thoughts, whatever's that come up, and wanting to learn how to have conversations with them is really useful. Uh, and yeah, like you said, should you just disregard? But there I'd, I'd ask you, like, why, why would you think or, or believe uh, that engaging with that stuff would ever be useful. Annie. Annie said, I've stopped doing compulsions. It's been two days. Uh, but my anxiety has increased when a thought comes up and my heart beats faster almost all day. Oh, will this end? Okay. Uh, so, Annie, uh, the, uh, the two days of not doing compulsions has come to an end. Um, so, checking uh, for reassurance online if a feeling will go away is, is an example of a, a pretty common compulsion. Uh, it is really useful to shape mental health work around uh, skills we want to build and grow. While doing that, uh, it's useful to want to have any thought or feeling. Uh, so, you know, for instance, uh, the very first compulsion that I ever cut out, and, and so also, yeah, it can really help to see, there, there are a lot of compulsions. It is very unlikely, slash impossible, that anybody would cut out all compulsions for the first time for two days, one day, one hour. Uh, that's... Mm, because there's when we get started on mental health work, there's so many uh, compulsions. So it can help to first start thinking about just one compulsion. So for instance, the very first compulsion I cut out was to not check the door lock. Uh, I'd never not checked a door lock in my life. And, and so actually when it was assigned in therapy uh, for the first week that it was assigned, I didn't do it. I did more checking. I remember I would, I would uh, check all the appliances check so many different things, uh, check valuables, check windows, check if people were watching me in the apartment, etc. I would check so many extra things, then I'd go to the door because I was trying to delay actually going out the door, but then I would go out the door and I would, I would check the door lock many, many times because I'd been doing lots of checking. And so then I went, uh, I went back uh, to see the therapist after a week and explained I, I didn't cut it out, and this was supposed to be the easiest compulsion to cut out, um, and yeah, I remember, you know, the therapist, uh, she offered, you know, medication. She was like, well, maybe this is, you know, if you can't do the easiest one, this might like, you might, uh, want some extra support or something like that. But, um, that would have taken longer. Like I would have had to get on, uh, you know, a wait list, see a psychiatrist, etc. Um, and so I was like, no, no, like I'm going to do it. And uh, then the next week, I can't remember if it was like right away or I probably still waited a couple days, procrastinated a couple days before trying again. Uh, but then, yeah, when I finally cut out checking the door that morning, there was so much anxiety, like not doing the compulsion just had me stuck uh, in the hallway outside of my apartment, uh, full blown panic attack because I couldn't, you know, I, I what it was you know, every cell in my body wanted to check the door lock and walking away felt like it surely it would be the end of the world. And I was causing the end of the, yeah, not just the, the entire universe. Uh, but eventually, yeah, I went to school. I was still super anxious the entire day. The focus, though, of all this was not on 
lowering anxiety. Um, yeah, I was, I was very, very anxious every time I went out the door for the rest of the week um, and the week after that, absolutely. Uh, yeah, now I wouldn't think about a door lock at all, ever. But that was because I, it was about approaching it like physical fitness. It was about wanting to do the sweaty work. It was about wanting to tackle that challenge, wanting to feel that urge to check the door and not check it. Um, it wasn't about trying to control a feeling or get rid of a feeling. Um, and so, yeah, it can really help to shift that focus to the thing we want to be doing more of. Uh, because, yeah, there'll be a lot of anxiety. So, yeah, you're starting to experiment with taking on challenges uh, and exploring cutting out compulsions, which is amazing. Um, and, yeah, connecting, you know, with a therapist or uh, with a community of people that are also cutting out compulsions and doing the things they want to do could be really uh, useful, like joining us today. So, yeah, thanks for showing that. <laughs> and speaking... Actually, hi, the, uh, the next comment there, <clears throat> I kind of related to this. How is the period, amount period, of period, willpower period, Jesus intrusive willpower. Indeed. It's, it's intense, right? Like taking on these challenges is a super intense experience. Utsav, you have, can I know what your age is? That is... So I hope, I hope this is like this is a mental health related uh, question, but my age is 43. And Heil is sending everybody intrusive willpower. Thank you, Heil. Yes, everybody have some just as you're going about your day, just like you would suddenly feel an intrusive thought. Yeah, feel some intrusive willpower and do a thing. Yeah, Haya points out. Mark also has a book. I remember I downloaded it back in the day. Thank you, Haya. <laughs> Mezzamin, you said, I notice plants don't wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks. How can I be more like a plant and get better sleep? Notice, pl plants are excellent teachers. I, it's really fun to go out during the day and notice how a tree or some other plant is doing the daytime. Plants don't wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks because of how plants interact with experiences during the daytime. If a person doesn't want to have their sleep uh, dis delayed or disrupted uh, or when somebody you know sends me a message or we meet and they mention that they're having troubles with sleep the first thing I ask them about is how they start their day how are they interacting with experiences during the day and yeah we can learn a lot uh, from plants about how to interact with our days differently then it's much easier to sleep like a plant at night Oh, Phil's off. Yeah, he said, are the courses on Toolkit the only ones you have? You should make more. <laughs> Man, they've really helped me make strides in my recovery. Phil's off, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, the, uh, at the moment, they are the only ones, but I am making more. And yeah, it's, it's been, so it's been an amazing experience the last, I'd say, like two years. I've really focused on uh, working with uh, coaching clients, uh, working with people around the world one on one, and uh, yeah, part of that was like that's a uh, been a really amazing experience uh, to connect with people on their journeys, and I am shifting things slowly to you know make more online courses, shift to you know making more books and and other resources uh, so that. Uh, they're more scalable so that more people can access them. But I also think, yeah, like professionally, so thinking of my own personal development, working with people, understanding what's useful to people, it's been very helpful the last two years to really work with uh, people one-on-one. -on -one. And so now, over the next couple of months, I'll be creating more resources to kind of take uh, that experience and you know, what I've been seeing works really well uh, I've been sharing lots of different exercises with clients and so seeing how people interact with those. And now, yeah, I hope to share more of those. So yeah, thank you. I'm glad the 
the resources that are there have been really helpful to you. And yeah, hopefully I intend to share more resources uh, in the months ahead. Yeah. Khan, thanks for joining us. Oh, Bogus. He said, I have a question. If anxiety disorders aren't natural to us human beings, how did it form in the first place? Oh, they're very natural. What century did it even start to develop? And does it mean people were happier back then? Oh, no, 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 no. There's uh, all sorts of, uh, like if you look in uh, old uh, religious texts in particular, uh, all sorts of documentation of uh, things we would recognize as like intrusive thoughts and things like that. Even in a recent live stream, I was sharing uh, a story from a, a Buddhist sutra that was written around the 100 uh, CE, I think. Um, or 100 BCE, and uh, yeah, it refers to intrusive thoughts, all, all the classic ones, sexual intrusive thoughts, harm intrusive thoughts that we would uh, uh, recognize. Uh, these, and the person wanting to like go and use meditation to clean them away. Yeah, all of this stuff is totally classic. Um, you can see how exactly um, anxiety disorders and things like that would evolutionarily <laughs> be kind of useful at first. Right, if you're just <clears throat> constantly terrified that anything could be a snake or a tiger, yeah, that would that probably help some humans survive. And then Bogus, you said, I need answers, but I'd say, yeah, you probably don't need answers. Ah, and Phil's up, as Phil's up points out here, uh, if you get Bogus. If you get hit by an arrow, does the haircut of the person who shot it, the origin of the wood it's made of, or the speed at which it flies matter? Yeah. Excellent question. And Phil's other explains what matters is how you react to the injury, how you tend to the injury. Totally. So Rabjot said, my therapist pointed out that I do more compulsions when I'm around a specific person. I often tend to do more compulsions when I'm upset and nervous. Compulsions are not restricted to intrusive thoughts. Mm. Yeah, it's really useful to notice. Oh, no, of course not. Uh, compulsions, it really helped me to recognize that we also do a lot of compulsions around topics we like. Um, and that's often to those compulsions we're doing around topics we like, uncertainties we like in our heads, out in the, the rest of the world, that then make it even more difficult not to do compulsions and more compulsions around things we dislike. TK, he said, I've done everything important in my life only because of the fear. And now I want to do things based on my values, but it seems fear is a better motivator than your values. Mm, I wouldn't say so. I, but if you've been using fear as a fuel, uh, then this, and this comes up all the time. If you've been using fear as fuel, then of course, it's really natural that that's easier. Uh, but the way I often describe it is that it's like an engine. And so the old engine ran on fear and was very reactive. But that old engine really polluted up our lives. And so now we recognize that the old engine was destroying the world. And we want to build a new engine that's based around values and it's proactive. But the thing is, that old engine, we spent decades building it. So it, w it worked really well. And then now when you switch to the new engine, uh, you've got to build it and yeah, so you don't really know what parts go in it or how to you know, Make it work well, and so it, it always feels slower at first uh, But the long-term benefits of building that new engine are massive having an engine that runs on values Which are always available to you where you can do things proactively and it's not going to pollute up your life uh, That's massively beneficial. So at first I always encourage people, what I found really helpful was uh, exploring how to build that new engine with curiosity. We don't have to expect it to work as fast as the old engine right now. And we can recognize that. We can recognize that pressure, the brain going, oh, come on, just put the old engine in. Like, let's do fear and compulsions. But we know now what it leads to. We know how destructive that old way of doing things can be to life. So let's give ourselves, allow ourselves the space to explore building that new engine that's actually healthy for us 
uh, and healthier for the world around us. My downward spiral, hello. Hope said, do I have to be honest with my friends about the skills I'm still struggling to build? Like reading, I wish I was good at it, but I zone out and get bored. I promised a friend to read a book together and discuss it. I couldn't keep up with her pace, and she doesn't know that I'm not good at reading as fast as her. At least, should I tell her about that? When we're building skills, I find it useful to share about what we want to build. Uh, and so, like for instance, if we struggle with swimming, rather than telling a friend, ah, I'm, I keep drowning, I, I really struggle with drowning, it can be useful to talk about what we want to learn. Like, oh, I want to learn how to swim. I want to learn how to swim faster and further. And I, I want to learn how to swim in deep waters and choppy waters. And we can even talk with our friends about learning that skill and asking them how do, how do they uh, have that skill? Where did they learn it? What would they suggest? And so, yeah, if you see your friend is like a really fast reader, it doesn't have to jump immediately to like, oh, I, I have a problem, I have a struggle, and I have to tell people I have a struggle. Because often there we're like, Right, we want to manage what they're, we worry they're thinking something about us. And so we want to manage that. But yeah, what I would ask is, would you like to learn how to read? Uh, would you like to learn how to read faster? Or uh, would you like to yeah, learn how to sit with a book and handle whatever feelings come up? And it, it sounds like your friend might have that skill. So yeah, what if, what if it was more about chatting with your friend about that skill that you want to build rather than seeing it as some kind of uh, problem. This plant. Everybody say hello to the plant. It's a good plant. It feels very, if this feels like a plant, like if there was a storm happening, uh, this plant would protect you. There we go, plant. Bogus said, why the songs get stuck in my head uncontrollably sometimes? That's an OCD thing, right? That's so goofy. How is that an uncertainty? I guess OCD will try to distract you in any way possible. Ah, well, it's an uncertainty. As you notice, the, you asked about it. The things can repeat in our heads all the time. The uncertainty uh, is often in the form of us wanting to control something, judge something. Um, yeah, you could look at it more so than uncertainty, just a urge to control, to label. Uh, and it comes from us saying, like, that shouldn't happen. Actually, we know that, you know, intrusive thoughts is a great example of this too. Everybody experiences the thoughts that some people will label as intrusive thoughts, but they don't label it. They don't judge it as this bad thing that shouldn't be there. Uh, same with things repeating in our head. The struggle is not from things repeating in our heads. That's just how the brain works. The struggle comes from us labeling that as wrong and going like, well, why is, why is this happening? It shouldn't be happening. Uh, that's the issue, not the thing repeating. My downward spiral said, I've been having a bad habit of following certain thoughts and attaching meaning to them, like trying to figure out something. Yeah, that up. That'll do it to you. KDLG. I said, what is the best way to contact, find your materials and services, YouTube, Instagram? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably, you know, I share more um, throughout the week on Instagram. Um, I have started recently an Instagram uh, subscription channel. That is uh, because, yeah, m my coaching practice is full. Um, and I'm going to be focusing more on making resources. So the Instagram subscription channel is a way to have uh, a, an ongoing channel of resources. 
So I share more detailed posts there, and then I share posts that are about topics that subscribers recommend. Uh, so that's one way to connect with a very direct resource. But then, yeah, in general, right now I'm sharing on YouTube around once a week. Uh, but on Instagram, I'll share, so I share in the subscriber channel probably around daily, and then pretty much every other day on the, the kind of the uh, other sub, you know, Instagram channel. And so Instagram is probably the best place um, to get news on new things happening. Because, uh, yeah, there'll be more resources coming out in the months ahead. And then in the new year, uh, I'm looking forward to doing a bunch of uh, in-person events. Uh, because, they, yeah, connecting more and more with, of course, uh, you wonderful people as a community, but also recognizing just how important, how increasingly important uh, doing things in person is becoming as, yeah, we end up spending more time online, but also... Uh, so much of what happens online is is getting uh, kind of affected or influenced by AI. Um, and it'll become more and more important that we learn how to do things uh, in person. So yeah, if uh, you don't have the my Instagram link, it's uh, yeah, instagram.com slash Mark W. Freeman. Rocky Fighter, he said, I have confusion about which motivation is better, money or parents, and I am nothing do work. Mm, Rocky Fighter, I'm not sure uh, what you're asking there. M1 MBZ, thank you for uh, saying nice leaf. I will pass it along. Amy, uh, he said, what are your tips for less worrying? Um, hmm. Um, if I had a tip to worry less, so I, I wouldn't start there with worrying less. I would assume that if somebody is worrying, they, they probably feel they have really good reasons to worry. And so what I would look at at first isn't the worrying, but what, is, what are the reasons? So what's that goal they're trying to chase? Because um, that's often how the worrying, especially that kind of automatic worrying that happens in our heads, where the brain just goes, wow, well, what about a thing? The brain is just reacting to a goal that we've set, and it's just trying to help us with that goal. And so it's yeah, really useful to start looking at what those goals are. Uh, yeah, so I would start there. Not so much. I would see the, so right, the worrying is an outcome of an approach to life. And we can change that approach to life. It's an approach to uncertainty, uh, to experiences. Uh, but first, I would look at what is that approach. Bogus, you asked a question here. You said, why is OCD catastrophic? And why do we think it's true? How did we learn to fall for it? And so I don't know what your first phrase there, but like, why is it catastrophic? I don't know what that means. Um, when you say, how do we learn to fall for it? This is actually um, where I, I don't know if you caught earlier, I mentioned that it's the compulsions we like that fuel the obsessions we hate. And, and that's how we learn to fall for it. Because uh, we start interacting with uncertainties we like. So, so for, for instance, somebody's like walking to the grocery store. And in their head, they're like thinking about what they're going to eat later. They're doing a lot of planning uh, around, uh, you know, like, oh, I can eat this food or is this food right? Or like, well, that I could do that for that meal. And they're just, they're really trying to like get their meal plan right for the week. And they're doing that while they're doing something else. So there they are walking in the world. There's so many amazing things happening in the world. They're in their head trying to get a meal plan right. It was so helpful to recognize that that's this, what I'm doing there, if I do something like that, is setting up a, a way of interacting with uncertainty, with experiences, which my brain is then going to extend to uncertainties or experiences that I find threatening. Because if I'm teaching my brain that it's good to, one, not be present, so... You know, if I'm walking, I should be thinking about something else. I should be thinking about how to get something right. I should be trying to control things. In my head, 
around something that's not threatening, like just what am I going to eat, it is completely natural then that if some kind of uncertainty comes up that is threatening, like what if the world is destroyed by a space whale, I will find it extremely difficult not to obsess constantly about space whales while I'm doing other things. Because I taught my brain that when we're walking in this incredible planet that we have, I should be in my head trying to get meal plans right. So if we teach ourselves to be mindless in situations that are not threatening, it's very difficult not to practice those compulsions um, in situations that are threatening. Yeah. And so that's why it's really useful to not look at, like often what we'll label as like OCD or we'll label as any kind of disorder. Uh, it's so important to just look at how we interact with existence. How do we interact with a human brain? Let's see, maybe I'm gonna adjust the angle here a bit. As the sun has come out, which is wonderful. But maybe I'll, yeah, let's move things a little bit here in my, my wonderful plant. I don't wanna, I don't wanna mess up the plant, the plant's roots down there. Okay. Isabel said, hey, thoughts on tackling anxiety when our daily actions conflict with our values. I value animals, including humans, eyeballs. So intrusive thoughts often creep in when consuming animal products, etc. So Isabel, yeah, I'm wondering, so when you say thoughts on tackling anxiety when our daily actions conflict with our values. I'm, yeah. Isabel, can you, I don't know if there's a, based on what you shared there, don't you, wouldn't the anxiety be expected? Yeah, when you say tackling anxiety, well, yeah, what are you looking for? Uh, what, do you, what do you want to do? Taj said, hey bro, what's up? So what advice do you have for maintaining recovery when life throws you curveballs? Oh, this is good because it's going to do that. I have a loved one who might be sick. Oh, I'm noticing feelings that uh, I stopped reacting to you, getting me to react. Yeah. So often right there, it's so useful to have compassion to ourselves. It's so useful to understand um, why the feelings that come up, why I say some thoughts that come up, why we would react to them. Um, yeah, because there will often be experiences as we're going through life uh, and we'll want to control them. And it's so uh, natural and understandable because they'll be about uh, people or topics that we really care about. Our brains, when they throw up intrusive thoughts, anxiety, often that's just the brain's way of saying, hey, there's a thing here I care about. Uh, our brains don't know how to express that. They are <laughs> the ways our, our brains are, are an overprotective parent that does not, does not know how to express love um, and you know, really wants to do something. And the only way it knows how to do that is to worry about something bad happening or to cook us some soup. But the, brain doesn't, the brain's not very good at cooking soup, so it just does the, the worrying part. And it helps so much when we can start to translate that. When, so, so like a, a question I, I like to ask or like to consider, if I notice my brain throwing something up, uh, to rather than look at the content there and get caught up with that, uh, is to ask like, well, wh what is happening in my life right now that's really uncertain? What's going on around things that I care about? And what we'll often see there, like you, you mentioned, right? They'll often, maybe there's something affecting a family member, uh, somebody we care about, and there's a lot of uncertainty there. And so when we notice that uncertainty, uh, it makes sense that our brains are going to want to control that. Um, and they, they won't know how. And so in that moment, I, I find it's useful to even just, just to notice that, to see uh, that urge to control. Um, to see that pain there and to have understanding. Of course we want to fix that. Of course we want certainty. Uh, 
but we can't control those uncertainties right now. However, what we can do is give. We can give our time and energy to the people we care about. Uh, we can look at those things we don't control, but ask like, okay, I don't, I don't control that and I know I want to. So what can I create? Uh, what do I want to build? Uh, what do I want to share with that person I care about? And to do that. And yeah, the brain will still be like, yeah, but we got to control this or we got to do this. And we're like, yeah, I know we want to. But right now what we can do is give this. And so that's what we're going to do. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I hope, you know, take care of yourself. And I hope, uh, yeah, your loved one is, uh, yeah, doing well as they navigate that health issue too. S. You asked, why does Toolkit ask for an address? Is it a physical book? Um, so S, I assume you're talking about the courses. Um, no, it has to do... Um, it would ask for an address for the online course because of things like sales tax. Um, and also, you have to buy with a credit card. And so if you're buying with a credit card, um, it's going to rate it's going to verify your credit card against the address. Right, like it would, you got to put down the address that is registered to that uh, credit card. Bogus. You said, any tips on trusting myself, but how do I know I should trust myself? So the tip would be, um, to throw away the second question you asked there. Uh, we trust ourselves because it's useful to us. <laughs> but you say, how do I know I should trust myself? Oh, that's going to, that's going to, uh, I know I should trust myself because uh, it's useful to me to trust myself. Uh, I give, because trust, it's not about knowing something, it's about something we give. Uh, you could think of yourself like a colleague of yours. So if you go into work, <laughs> Imagine you go into work and you sit beside somebody and every day you like look over them, you like look over the cubicle and you're like, how do I know I can trust you? And you just are constantly questioning them like that. Uh, your colleague is not going to feel uh, very welcome. Your colleague is not going to feel like they uh, can, uh, you know, take on responsibility, that they can try things because they've got you constantly there checking if they're trustworthy which is going to make them feel that if they screw up, they're going to be in big trouble. You know? So how would you like to support your colleague, uh, which is you? Kimberly. Kimberly, thank you so much for the donation. I really appreciate the support, and I appreciate the little, the little character uh, marching along. Thank you for joining and marching along with us today. Oh, well, Utsav, thank you. You said you've helped me in a lot of ways. Thank you, and keep on building what you love to build while having any feelings or thoughts alongside. Utsav, thank you. I really appreciate that. To you as well. Enjoy in the week ahead. Uh, building the things you want to build while having, uh, you know, stuff up there or in the world around you. Rafat. He said, how do you stop thinking about contracting a life-threatening disease from, say, knocking a chair by foot accidentally? So I don't find it useful to try not to think about it. What was way more helpful, especially when tapping a chair, uh, was to uh, accept that I had contracted like a, a life-ending uh, disease. Uh, and saying, like, look, brain, uh, no, today is my last day. So do I, do I want to spend my last day on a bunch of compulsions in my head? Do I want to spend my last day like avoiding things because I'm uh, you know, chasing around some brain stuff? Uh, or do I want to live my last day out uh, in the world doing the things I want to do uh, because it's my last day? So I found it way more helpful to actually as soon as the brain goes, whoa, did you catch a bad disease? And it wants to have this debate and it's like, 
it wants to have that debate for days maybe, like checking, like, oh, does it feel okay? I found it way more helpful to just take it to the conclusion that it's actually terrified of. So no, like, yeah, there, I did contract um, chair tapping disease and I have hours to live. So how do we want to spend those last few hours? And Yash asked a question right after that, which said, how to accept existential anxiety? And the answer would be the same. You'd be like, yeah, I'm going to live right now. Rather than spending uh, our lives debating existential anxiety questions. So I would take it to whatever disaster it is and then get on with living. And yeah, like risking it. Like the brain's like, yeah, but what if, what if we live in a simulation or things aren't real or nothing matters? Oh, then do really important things. Like go and, like go and commit to something <laughs> long term. Go and do something that would, like your brain is like, you can't do that if we live in a simulation or you can't do that if you don't know the meaning of existence. Yeah, do more of whatever it says you can't do. Uh, Amy asks, do you still do coaching? Uh, so I, 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 I do coaching with um, uh, the clients I'm working with now. Um, of course, yeah, so it's still, it's a big part of my day today. Um, and I loved it. Like, it, um, at the same time, the I'm at the moment not taking on new clients. Uh, so yeah, so I still do it, but also, um, yeah, just to also be aware of the amount of uh, time I have. So I want to make sure that um, I can, uh, you know, be there and support uh, the people that I'm working with. And so I also have to look at just managing um, the amount of, uh, yeah, just the amount of uh, time and, and client load, which, uh, yeah, is also a huge uh, privilege. It's like a huge honor uh, to get to work with uh, people around the world navigating uh, these difficult uh, changes and navigating these human brains that we take on. So, yeah, it's also, it's not um, uh, a, uh, how do you describe it? Yeah, it's like still an amazing thing to do. And it's, um, I know, really special to be able to uh, have a full practice. So I think, yeah, if we have any uh, uh, people here who, who work in mental health too, yeah, like, um, having a full practice uh, is also, yeah, not something that's, uh, that's also a very special thing. And so I'm really appreciative of that too. Uh -huh. Samurai Jack, sending love from Sri Lanka. Oh, send love to you. I hope you're having a good day. The Teddy's channel. He said, how to notice when a thought occurs to you and actually engaging in it. Sometimes when the earworm is rampant, it's difficult to distinguish between the two. Uh, yeah, Graham, the... I find that the thing to look at is when we notice that we're engaging with it. Because uh, we'll, we will react to things automatically or we haven't noticed. But not having to get caught up in like, oh, because we could start judging that we reacted to it, uh, which the brain loves. Because uh, now we're like, again, it's the same thing. We're seeing ourselves as this problem to fix. So making it not a problem. Uh, if we've been reacting to it, we've already been engaging with it. Uh, we didn't notice when it came up. We just kind of automatically started engaging with it, wanting to control it. When we notice that, always making that okay, always celebrating that awareness. It's incredible that we can notice how we're getting caught up in brain stuff. Uh, and yeah, sure, we want to not get caught up in it, but judging that just becomes more of the problems to control. And so yeah, could it be okay to not know? Uh, but whenever you notice, you can celebrate. Josh. He said, how do I learn to keep doing things I love and stop avoiding due to thoughts and feelings? Uh, so one of the things that can be fun to explore 
is uh, shrinking the amount of things we're requiring ourselves to do. But really exploring it with curiosity. So I, I like to call these festivals of curiosity. And what you can do is say, set aside a month to rather than say, oh, I've got to do this thing, like I've always wanted to do, I should be doing this thing. Instead, say, look, I'm going to take a month to be really curious about this topic that I enjoy or this area I'd like to explore. And so I'm not going to jump right into like forcing myself to do some like kind of right performance or ritual. So for instance, if somebody wanted to cook for themselves more, often what people do is they go, oh, I, sh I shouldn't be eating out so much, I should cook for myself more. And then they, they like really force themselves to do some kind of right way of cooking for themselves and it's intense and then they, they burn out, they get bored, uh, and they drop it. And then the next month they do it again. Like, I should be doing this. But kind of similar to what I was just talking about, we do it with mental health too. Like, oh, I shouldn't be engaging with the thoughts. Okay, like, let's not engage with thoughts. Uh, so if somebody was going to explore around cooking, what I would suggest doing there, and what I found so helpful, uh, is to plan a month of activities to be curious about cooking. So to explore cooking for a month, to explore food for a month, and to plan in that series of activities and events, just like a festival. Or like, you know how you would go to a festival and there'd be many, many different things? And like, yeah, some you'll be interested in and some you won't be that interested in, but they're all part of the festival. And so that can really help keep us engaged. Uh, so sprinkling in lots of new things, so I might, yeah, like there'll be days where I might practice cooking something at home, but there'll be other days where, uh, yeah, maybe, so w when I was exploring cooking, uh, sometimes I got those kind of uh, meal boxes where like the ingredients are already kind of laid out and you, you practice putting together uh, a meal, uh, following some instructions. Uh, I took cooking classes. I, I did a lot of work around cooking with foods that I'd always avoided. There was just a lot of engaging activity uh, to give me novelty, but also to take me out of my comfort zone. Uh, and that became the consistent practice. After exploring things like that, I was also able to see what I actually engaged with and what I enjoyed. And then it became much easier to build a consistent practice around food. So yeah, so for anything that anybody wants to explore, I'd start with a festival of curiosity. What would an interesting month look like just exploring that subject, not having to force some kind of like controlled ritual. Lucas, hello, how are you? I said, curious about your thoughts on the Buddhist concepts of no self and interbeing. How does it relate to values and individual uh, differences? The, so I find with values, uh, especially, uh, yeah, being able to recognize that we can't exist on our own, uh, that we can't exist solo, that we are always uh, connected to others and interacting with others. Uh, personally, I find very uh, helpful uh, and really beneficial for looking at values because I think, yeah, sometimes with values we might see them as very individualistic. But if we approach values purely from some kind of individualistic or competitive framework, uh, I think we often struggle uh, because, of course, like, even, like we were just talking about food, you can't. Uh, it's very <laughs> unlikely uh, that you can uh, have a meal that doesn't depend on other people. Other people who were working in fields somewhere, other people who planted those seeds, people uh, thousands of years ago who figured out how to uh, cultivate those seeds uh, and uh, yeah, make the, like change, transform them into the 
uh, state that they are now that we enjoy. Uh, like I was always, uh, there's in Oaxaca, Mexico, there is the uh, ethnobotanical gardens. And so they've taken an old cavalry base that's kind of in the center of Oaxaca near the cathedral. And they've turned it into this amazing garden. And the garden really both represents the, uh, the incredible biodiversity that you can find in, in Oaxaca State in Mexico, uh, but also the important uh, cultural significance. So it's called an ethnobotanical garden. The cultural significance of the different plants to the communities in the Oaxaca Valley, uh, which has been uh, inhabited for like ever and ever and ever. And it is in fact where we, the first evidence of several vegetables we now see as very common or standard come from. And in particular, corn, uh, squash, and beans, uh, all in the general area. I can't, there's one of them that I think is like a bit further away, but in that general valley uh, in Mexico is where we, we get some like r really key staple crops from. And when you're at the garden, one of the things they have there is, are, is very early corn. And corn used to just look like a kind of grass. Like you hold corn and it fits, or the original corn fits in the palm of your hand and they're just like these kind of tiny, cute little seeds. I think, you know, there's like six or eight little seeds um, that kind of look like a cob of corn. Uh, but people working for decades, who knows, centuries, turned that little uh, mini corn uh, grass into what we now know as corn. Uh, and we benefit so much from the work and the care they took. So yeah, we can't eat something like corn without a connection to thousands of years of communities. And so yeah, when we think about values and interbeing, I think it's really useful to approach uh, our values from a perspective of being part of a very big community. And of course, also not being separate from the natural community. Because yeah, sure, there were people uh, who turned that little grass into corn, but that wouldn't have been possible without nature. Uh, so yeah, we really can't separate ourselves from the world around us. Erica says hello to plant, plant, say hello to Erica. Erica, plant says hello. Uh, Mike, welcome. Like you said, thanks for all the support on the Discord this week. Oh yeah, that was really, uh, so many uh, community members uh, were sharing uh, useful insights there this week. Like I said, uh, it was so revolutionary for me to be supported like that. I'm having a few issues with the problem solving monster being so beneficial to me with my work now. As a software engineer, it's always very natural to fix things, but I'm working on it personally. Yeah, the, so I, like I learned about values um, from uh, working with uh, software companies on how to design uh, products that are actually useful to customers. And so in particular, the first place I was introduced to it was uh, vi with video game companies. So yeah, I would not uh, approach things like values as separate um, from working in software. Actually, it's really helpful to use a set of values to guide our work in technology. Canada's Cup Noodles said, uh, Hey, Market Channel has been extremely helpful. I practice mindfulness and meditation every day now, but sometimes I feel the pressure of, I have to meditate or I have to be mindful. Yeah, so then, then it could be fun to, uh, yeah, not meditate. Uh, and, you know, mindfulness is the practice of doing what we're doing. Uh, so, yeah, you can just go do what you're doing. And so it could be fun. Yeah, what would it be like to bring your practice just into your everyday life? Marzina said, I need to feel a certain way with my kids and cutting those compulsions are extremely distressing. How to approach those difficult challenges and still stay committed and motivated to cut compulsions? Hmm.
So Marzina, so I would, I would ask the thing that I would explore, and so say you're working with a, you know, a professional or, or um, however you're exploring mental health, is just the, the first line. I need to feel a certain way with my kids. Uh, so, is, so I would just say, is, is that true? Uh, do, like, do you actually need it? So like, for instance, I need to drink water today. I don't need to drink a fruit smoothie. However, I chose to drink a fruit smoothie this morning. <sighs> but technically, I don't need it. Um, yeah, because what, what you're establishing there at the start is when you say like, basically, I need this water, or it's the end of the world. Uh, then yeah, of course it's very difficult and very challenging. But is is it true that you need that? Um, are there other possibilities? Could it could it be possible that you don't need that feeling? And so that that would be where I'd start to explore that. Michael said, so I realized recently that I've used spirituality, like text screws, et cetera, as a way to escape or delete my sense of self like I'm a contamination. Do I celebrate a self and make up for lost time or begin where I am? Uh, yes, yeah, so Michael, I would begin where you are. Uh, always, always. Uh, our brains love to judge something we've done in the past as, as again, like some kind of contamination. Uh, and brains love that because we can't time travel and so we can't clean uh, things from the past. And, and so actually you even mentioning the sense of self um, and maybe so uh, when Lucas was asking about the sense of self earlier, I didn't get too much into that, you know, that kind of Buddhist concept of sense of self, but I find it can often trip people up um, and has been tripping up people for centuries because uh, you'll find in all sorts of hilarious Zen texts, you know, some student asking about like, there is no sense of self or like, they've been asked a question and they want to respond and so they respond that they they have you know they there is no personal self that exists and and there'll always be some hilarious response from the zen teacher like throwing a shoe at their head or or a, a, a roof tile or something like that um, because of course if, if you if you insist that you have no sense of self and somebody throws a roof tile at your head You'll, you'll probably discover pretty quickly that, that you have a self that has a very painful bump on its head. Smith said, so happy to hear of your plans for in-person events and appreciate um, the underlying values that are motivating you to do so. Oh, Smith, thank you. Yeah, I look forward to, yeah. We're, like, I think what we'll do when we do some in-person events coming up next year too is um, uh, I'll try to make sure I have some kind of special box that we can put our phones in. So also we'll have a we'll have a time for taking pictures and things like that. But uh, yeah, practicing spending time just with people, and we might not even sometimes do you know like mental fitness exercises or things like that. We might just do some events to spend time with people, and and practice that, because that can be a pretty extreme, <laughs> unusual practice now. So Matthew. You asked, uh, how do you, what do you do other than helping people with mental health? I um, eat donuts. Although I just discovered a donut shop that I was going to go and visit. Uh, I think it closed down. Um, so <laughs> what do I do then? I mean, I just sit and talk to plants. Um, I like, yeah, so uh, hiking. I like spending time in nature. Uh, also, again, yeah, our... I don't know if anybody's noticed, but um, the world is on fire. Um, and uh, yeah, we're uh, losing all sorts of wonderful natural uh, landscapes and environments and uh, plants and animals. I don't know if you saw there was a, a, a story in the news the other day or a report in the news the other day of an area in Antarctica where uh, a penguin community uh, was lost. So a penguin colony, I think they're often referred to, was lost because the ice uh, melted and broke up before uh, the babies in the colony could uh, develop their little like special uh, feathers for swimming. And uh, yeah, the natural environment is uh, changing so rapidly. 
and who are losing uh, so much so quickly. So yeah, I, I enjoy, and you know, one of the reasons for uh, going nomadic is to spend time in nature. Uh, we can end up spending a lot of time at computers. And absolutely, I do all sorts of things on computers and it, it's uh, a really valuable tool for creating, yeah, mental health tools that can be useful to people. Uh, but it's also really important that we connect with our world and care for it. Uh, now, mm, it's not a thing uh, to wait on or do later. So I like doing that too. And uh, what else do I do? Right now I'm taking Spanish lessons. I do that too. Mm -hmm. James, I hope you're well as well. He said, I always feel like I need to have all compulsions sorted and have the right feeling before I start improving my mental health. I guess that is still part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, no, like get started. Don't, don't wait. Uh, the kind of consistent pattern that the brain will trip us up on when we're struggling with our mental health is this idea that there's a thing that needs to be right or be cleaned before we live our lives. And usually you could look at it as just a particular feeling. And so I'll often describe it as like us asking a toaster for permission to live. So we're going to the toaster and being like, hey, can I go live my life? And the toaster, of course, because the toaster doesn't give us the answer. And we're like, oh, I didn't get the answer from the toaster. Okay, I better not go and live. Uh, and we've got to start to stop asking the toaster for permission and just live our lives. Ryan said, hey, I'm from Singapore. Hey to Singapore. Said your video is really helpful and you're, oh, one of the best OCD coach on YouTube. Oh, Ryan, that's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Thank you. S, you said, any tips on taking decision when I have so many choices? I can't choose one. How to take better decisions? Uh, that's what I find values are for. Yeah, having a rank set of values, I find so helpful. And so before making any decision, I'll always decide how I'll decide. And so I like to do that by picking three values and I'll rank them. And then I step into the decision, I set a time limit, and then based on those ranked values, I assess the options and pick the one in the time limit that aligns with those values I ranked, or kind of like scores the best out of them. Yeah, and then just trust in those. Uh, Cause yeah, we're not gonna have some right feeling, like similar to what James was talking about. We're not gonna have this right feeling that gives us permission to live our lives. So yeah, instead I'll trust in my values. Uh, I don't know what'll happen, but if I give my time and energy to some things I know are important to me, yeah, I'm gonna give myself trust to uh, handle whatever comes up. Mike said, I'm trying to make tomorrow's morning easy. Oh yeah, that's great. That is a skill I find so useful. So he said, I find that in the morning I end up being such a different person. No matter what I do, I still procrastinate and run away depression, anxiety in the morning. How can I approach this differently? I feel a bit stuck in this regard. Yeah, so I'd start with Mike, like what is the action you want to do in the morning? You're still going, there could still be like intrusive thoughts, depression, anxiety, other weird feelings, uh, even urges just to do something else that the brain is like, this is really important. It would be good to do this. 100% those can be there. And what is that action you want to do? Well, you bring those feelings along with you. So finding the way to make that as easy as possible. Amy said, I'm stuck in fight or flight. So the physical and mental symptoms are so debilitating. The mental stuff is terrible and making me worry about everything and everyone. Do you have any tips? Uh, and so Amy, and so this actually might be useful. So I wouldn't have any tips for anything you just explained there. And because tips or mental health work is going to be about the things we want to do and build and create. And so we'll usually feel this pressure to articulate some kind of contamination we want to get rid of. Uh, and right, we'll just describe it. And even this is something we'll do, you know, I used to do this all the time in my head, just thinking over, oh, oh, this is bad. This is wrong. I should be doing this. That's not right. I hate this, how do I get rid of this? Like we're just so focused on the contamination. But there's nothing that I could give a tip for around that. 
another way of describing it would be like if somebody just is describing all of the things they hate about drowning. I don't have any tips for drowning. But if the person wants to learn how to swim, if they're like, okay, I want to I wanna learn how to swim, but when I struggle with freestyle. What are some tips on how to swim freestyle? Then we can talk about tips. We can talk about tips around the things we want to be doing. But it, when we focus on just like, I, here's the thing I dislike, there's not much we can do with that. And so that's often, this like shift I'm talking about here, I find is, is one of the most useful shifts to make with mental health. And it's why I would say so many people, uh, like you see so much struggling, especially in online mental health communities, because they are just about sharing about a problem. And there's nothing we can do with that problem. But if we talk about where we want to go and what we want to do, then we can talk about tips on how to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, that shift could be really useful. Because uh, even thinking like how the brain will want us to go online and just like be like, oh, here's a thing I hate. But we're not going to find any solution to that. Yeah, what would you like to be doing instead? KCP, welcome. I hope you're having a good weekend. He said, in relationships, I struggle to switch from getting to giving because of inner child wounds and fears. Yeah. Are there ways to practice giving to others and ourselves to make that switch easier? Uh, no, I, I think KCP, like, part of it is even just recognizing um, uh, that kid, that, that kid that was hurt, uh, that they'll be there with you and, and making that okay. Just like if we were babysitting a kid and we, we knew, uh, what would be a good example? <laughs> like, uh, we knew that kid uh, had a, uh, a bad experience with uh, balloons when they were little. But also, we run a balloon shop. And so we know, and each day we gotta babysit the kid, we gotta take the kid to the balloon shop. Um, and so we understand we're helping the kid interact with balloons. Uh, because that's like a thing we're doing in our lives, but we also understand that that kid had a really bad experience with balloons when they were young. Um, and so, yeah, it's gonna, you know, we, we want to work with them on it, but we also have compassion uh, for where they're coming from. And we want to we wanna show them uh, that balloons can be amazing and fun, uh, but understanding at first they're always gonna be worried about a balloon popping. Um, and something uh, bad happening. Um, and so yeah, I find just finding ways to balance that uh, is just through, uh, you can see like if you were gonna you know, teach a kid how to love balloons after a, a, a painful experience, um, yeah, you'd probably do some fun things with balloons, uh, but also not have to like force it, uh, like not make them do some kind of like difficult exercise, like you're gonna go and sit in that room of balloons and you're gonna like it. Uh, yeah, probably that would increase <laughs> the, uh, the struggle and the pain. Uh, so yeah, it could be fun to explore. Uh, I don't know if you caught it earlier, I was talking about festivals of curiosity around something like food. Um, but it, yeah, it's something we could do around relationships too. Like what would it be like to explore relationships? What would it be like to learn about relationships um, for a month um, and just do different things around relationships? Um, and that, that could be a fun place to start. Like if you had a festival of relationships, what would be the different events, uh, the different activities, um, the different, you know, both actions that you could practice, but also things you could just experience and learn. Uh, like, you know, is it like watching, you know, there'd probably be some like movies about relationships. Um, you might have fun, you know, meeting new people, engaging in relationships. Uh, you might connect with uh, like somebody like a, a you know a relationship therapist or something like that too. You might read a book. Um, you might uh, explore friendships um, and romantic relationships and different types of relationships. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what uh, what you would uh, line up as a festival of curiosity around relationships. Velvet Adler, you see, you have a long ass question. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'll follow it through. He said, I'm a trans man and I pass very well in public. No one would guess that I wasn't born male. I find that there's a big disconnect between myself internally and who I present myself as to my friends because they don't know either. 
I felt like this negatively influences my mental health, even though I'm of the opinion that no one needs to know unless they're in an intimate relationship with me. I don't feel safe in coming out, being open about the aspect of my life in general, even though a part of me wants to be out. Do you have any tips for reconciling these feelings? Basically, I'm forced to live inauthentically for my own comfort and safety. So, so even like what uh, you articulated there at the end is, is so insightful. And it's so useful to recognize. Like there are actually, there are a bunch of different situations where people are put in a position where, uh, just as you described it, they're forced to live, um, you know, and even like not having to see it necessarily as inauthentically, but they are forced to live in particular ways to manage um, society and systems around them. Um, and there can be all sorts of uh, different levels of this and different situations. Uh, like even somebody who's just like going to an office where they may feel like or a workplace where they may feel they need uh, the job, but also it requires them to act in a way, um, to code switch in a way, to you know hide parts of themselves because they're like, ooh, actually this is a, a very antagonistic um, or oppressive place or system, but I need to do this right now um, because I need I need this paycheck. Um, or yeah, somebody living in a society where just they're in uh, a position where they feel under threat uh, in their community, people around them, etc. There are a lot of different situations where this can come up, uh, and so what it's so useful, and you see it already, but what it's so useful to understand is just this does have an impact on our mental health. Uh, I often describe right, mental health as the practice of being ourselves. And right, you see it, it is so useful to be ourselves. At the same time, uh, it's not necessarily as simple as like we can just be like, okay, I can just, I can just be myself and say whatever I want and, and, and do whatever I want and I don't have to uh, you know, uh, worry about anything else uh, happening. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, it, it's not that way. And so, yeah, like some of it uh, might be looking at, like if, if you're judging yourself um, for like not doing something that you feel pressure to do, uh, yeah, like it's, it's okay to uh, relieve that judgment because our, right, our brains, <laughs> our brains love that to like, to be like, oh no, like you should be perfectly authentic and uh, like putting that pressure on us where, yeah, it just, it, it might not always be possible. Um, at the same time, yeah, you might, um, cause you, and you see it there, yeah, like we take on, um, if uh, we can't be ourselves or we choose to kind of manage being ourselves in a particular situation, it's important to recognize, yeah, there's a cognitive load we're taking on there. Uh, that management of that, yeah, has an impact. Um, and so it's really, so I'd say for everybody, it's really important to recognize how we can support others in being themselves and allowing them to be themselves because uh, when we don't make space for that, that's, that's forcing them uh, to do this extra work that is like really stressful on our mental health. Uh, and so, yeah, I think Velvet Adler, you know, yeah, I'm not gonna have, um, you know, a, I would say like a specific, you know, action uh, tip to like go, like, go, like go and do a thing. Because uh, I think w you're actually seeing like really insightfully uh, the attention here. And uh, it's a tension that, you know, is, is often in place uh, in society that um, it's really useful for us to be able to be ourselves at the same time, uh, trying, you know, handling the uh, realities of a situation uh, is, yeah, or is going to have an impact on mental health. Uh, also, sometimes our brains uh, will will do you know two things one like put pressure on us to be like you know perfectly authentic for instance um, but then also put pressure to control 
uh, how we're managing ourselves around others. And sometimes it, you know, it also might tell us that, uh, yeah, like we have to manage that in situations we don't have to manage it um, is another possibility. Uh, but I think, yeah, like you're very insightfully seeing uh, what's going on. And yeah, it sounds like, like you see the context of, of the situation and also some things you might like to do and explore. Uh, yeah. So I think kindness to yourself with whatever the brain, the brain is pushing you on. Yeah, if you decide like, hey, this situation, I don't, I don't, I don't need to take on like coming out in, in some particular way to people. Yeah, That's, you, you don't have to let the brain push you around on that. Um, at the same time, yeah, you may notice like that, that is some extra, some extra things to carry. Yeah. And so in either direction, giving compassion to yourself. Hmm. Alberto said, uh, if a goal can be interpreted in several ways, for example, because I value it or because I I'll be seen as smarter, the latter being compulsive. Is there a way of gaining clarity here? Oh, I don't, Alberto, I don't know without more detail, details, Alberto, what, um, what to share there. But in general, I find the like, idea of gaining clarity uh, is usually just our brain like, pushing us uh, to get something. Uh, yeah, like what, what if you won't have clarity there? How could you make a decision? Mukabukuru. Thank you for the kind words. In winter, I said, how can I forgive myself for the horrible things I've done in the past? I don't want to be that person, and I want to be better. Yeah, so in winter, it's great to notice that. Uh, yeah, we don't have to like forgive. Uh, usually with forgiveness, again, that's, that's, the brain loves to bring up contamination from the past. And you're like, you have to clean this. And then we're like, I'm not a time traveler. How do I clean it? Um, and that's kind of what forgiveness is. And so, of course, we can't like, go and clean that. But you see what's so useful. What we can do is say, look, in this moment, I know I want to give something different. So, oh, brain, it's so useful. Thank you, brain, for reminding me. I don't want to, to give those things that I gave in the past. I want to give some different things. So I'm going to go do that right now. And Ryan, thank you so much for the donation. I appreciate it. This is your first time in a super chat. I see you throwing up balloons. I really appreciate you joining us today uh, and sharing that. And Ryan said, I feel anxious when people express interest in me. I think it's due to my low self-esteem. My brain believes that I'm not worthy of love. One day they might see through my true self and leave me. I mean, so Ryan, so this is really common. And actually, it's fascinating, right? Because so often when we think of social anxiety, uh, we, we might kind of stereotypically think of avoidance. But I find what you're describing there is really common. Uh, I struggled with that as well. Like I, it was like I always wanted to be liked, but any amount of liking me I saw as like some kind of threat. Because I was like, oh, I'm going to disappoint them, or I'm going to get hurt, or, or like there's something else going on here, or they must just be wrong, or I would just ignore it. And so a concept that uh, I often share with people, uh, um, if you ever think of uh, um, what is often referred to as fan service in uh, K-pop. Uh, and so where, yeah, they, what that is, and actually like, it's a concept that's uh, more widely known too, but it's about, say, some kind of, uh, you know, say, in that a pop star or something like that, giving their fans the opportunity to learn about them, uh, giving their fans the opportunity to like them, to share uh, in their, their everyday experience. And so exploring what that would be like uh, for you to share with other people. Uh, can you let people be a fan of you? And what would that look like? And that is, like, it's going to feel uh, scary at first. It's going to feel vulnerable. But can you explore that vulnerability and the risk of letting people like you?
Kesha. You said how to handle constant distractions and be more focused. Um, to, by, by practice. Yeah, we, focus is a capacity like endurance. And so if we don't like practice, uh, you know, cardiovascular exercise, we can't expect to have endurance. If we don't practice exercises to focus, uh, like whether it's sitting down to read in a, a noisy place or something like that, then yeah, of course we don't have that capacity. Erica mentioned a really important message here. Everybody, we should stop shooting all over ourselves. Jisha said, how to choose when something comes up suddenly? For example, I want to attend this live, but my sis keeps calling me for choosing a gift, which is also important to me. So how to choose between two important values? Um, yeah, you can give yourself trust and choose one. Uh, Amy, I said, what type of therapy helped you most with anxiety? And, and so actually, Amy, this relates to what we were talking about earlier. I don't know if this question could have been asked before I explained earlier, but it'll really help you instead of looking at a therapy to help with anxiety, but what therapy is going to help you doing the things um, you want to be doing in life. <laughs> oh, Erica, this is a great point. On interbeing, Erica shared this. On interbeing, to make an apple pie from scratch, first, you have to invent the universe. And Carl Sagan said that. It's so true. Look, just imagine, it's so incredible, right? Because when we know so much about the universe, we still don't have any evidence that there are other habited, inhabited uh, planets out there. An apple is absolutely amazing. When you think of an apple in the context of this vast universe around us, we just happen to be on the special incredible planet that has apples. There may not be apples anywhere else in the universe. So enjoy that apple pie. Like, please, everybody, today, let's all go and have an apple pie. It's like a unique, uniquely wonderful phenomenon in our universe. Oh, Amy, I see your comments about uh, your, your kind words and uh, being interested in working together. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, if you have any questions as you're going through the book, um, I do really only have one book, but there's a UK version and a US version. And this because publishing companies don't know about the internet. Uh, so uh, yes, you feel free to gift one of the books. I'm sorry it was confusing. But if you have any questions as you're working on the exercises in the book, yeah, please feel free to, to reach out. I'm yeah, happy to share any ideas or feedback on exercises. Milani, you said OCD themed depression. Am I depressed, etc.? Nobody talks about it, how to get better. So it can really help to see um, that if you were searching online to find out if people talk about it, that is an example of a compulsion. Um, I know for a fact that this is a topic that is widely, extremely frequently talked about. Uh, and you're seeing a phenomenon that happens that because the real fear there is like, I have this bad thing that's different from OCD, I'm gonna get depressed. And then typically with this, because this fear about depression comes up very often, um, typically, it's a fear of then what getting depression would lead to. Uh, and, and so really seeing it's not OCD about depression, it's OCD about these compulsions to get certainty about a health issue, which you fear will lead to some bad event, like any kind of OCD, like even a classic hand washing, right? The person's not, it's not about hand washing, the person's worried, oh, what if I get this terrible disease that is then going to cause this bad thing, just like you, are worried about the disease of depression causing some bad thing. Uh, so it'll really help to shift the focus uh, to cutting out the compulsions, like searching online for reassurance that somebody else has the same thing. Because uh, the more you search for reassurance, the more you'll be convinced nobody has the same thing. Joshua Jazz, good morning. And Raj and Murica and Lewis. And Ryan, you said, how to practice acceptance of imperfection in our personality. 
uh, so one of the things to look at there are the are you like judging and comparing your personality because uh, that would be a useful compulsion to cut out Jishi said is doing valued action is also chasing idea it could be yeah if we're getting like trying to do valued action right uh, yeah that could put a lot of pressure on us and we'll always be convinced we're doing it wrong Mike, he said, following the no self discussion, I always find Buddhist texts which say it straight up doesn't exist or things like reality is an illusion really struggle with this contaminating Buddhism. I find the Buddhism completely loses me. I don't know how to approach these concepts. Then don't approach them. Milani, yeah, you said executive dysfunction related to OCD, but just as a question, yeah, I'm not sure what you're asking about there, Milani. Uh, Murica said, automated thought, feeling, and behavior. Last one is the only thing you control. That's a fact. Thanks for sharing that. Michael, thank you so much uh, for the donation. I'm like, this is your, yeah, your first time uh, sharing a super chat uh, donation too. Thank you. I really appreciate the support. And thank you, yeah, for stopping by and sharing your, your questions today. So, yeah, thank you for the donation and the wishes for safe travels. Sir Ackman said, my intrusive thoughts are so blasphemous. They're bullying me and disrespecting my religion. My intrusive thoughts are most disrespectful and cringy. I don't want these cringeworthy thoughts. I really get frustrated with them. They are cringe. I hate these thoughts. They are attacking my religion. Mm. So yeah, Sir Ackman, you see how much time and energy you spent on just writing that out? But you, you, you didn't ask a question there. And so it could be really useful to just notice like the amount of time and energy you're giving to the thoughts, right? Because even if we're just like writing out about them, uh, we're just saying to the brain, hey brain, this is important, give me more of these because I'm gonna spend more time and energy on them. Oh, Erica, yeah, thank you for mentioning the question there too. Chaos. He said, I know I need to accept the thoughts, and I was doing well doing European act, but then later on, I get this massive guilt. Why these thoughts and what people would think of me, and I start doing compulsions. Ah, okay, so it could be, um, so you see, like, classic compulsions we do there, where we start, like, thinking about what other people are thinking, and then wanting to control them, and, and things like that. Uh, you see the, the fears there you're actually worried about. Uh, like not so much thoughts, but like getting rejected from people or being alone. And so the thing to do there, when stuff like that comes up, because it's just the brain uh, looking to control stuff we care about, is actually shift the focus to what are those things you want to grow with people. Because uh, yeah, thoughts, like getting caught up in thought, it's no different. Like there's a tree across from me right now, and I can see some leaves on it that are dead. So should I not go and talk with people today because I saw dead leaves? Or even this, this leaf right here, look, look at this leaf. This is not a perfect leaf. See that? Look at that. Look at that. How can I talk here with you when there's an imperfect leaf? I can see. I can very clearly see it. I, I just touched it. That's the same with thoughts. Uh, yeah, like they're, they're just things we experience. But if you're really attaching this, like, this meaning to, like, oh, I experienced a bad leaf, therefore I am a bad leaf seeing person and so I can't interact with people like that's that's where the compulsions happen that really get in the way so you don't have to do that you can see bad leaves and you can build relationships with people so yeah when you notice that getting caught up in that that like oh, I'm a bad leaf person what do you actually want to give to people Nick so what to do when OCD uses your values against you? I said, I value others' health. Yeah, so, and then like you said, it feels selfish to not wash my hands again or to not do some type of contamination-related compulsion. How to accept that, yep, maybe I'm spreading something everywhere, but I'm going to go do X thing that I value. Yeah, so Nick, one of the things um, that can be useful to see, like, your values are going to be about actions you give and when, like, really watch out for choosing actions that are 
like just 100% guaranteed to fuel compulsions. Uh, so yeah, like an, a value of I value other people's health. Uh, yeah, like you, you know then the brain is gonna turn that into uh, compulsions. So yeah, like that, that just might be uh, not a thing um, to explore as a value uh, right now, like the thing I would ask is like, well, what have you explored, for instance, uh, what values you would choose if you said, I value my mental health? What values would you choose there? Yep, so Ahmed, Erica, <laughs> Erica is raising some really great points about these not being questions. Uh, you, yeah, you see that you're just uh, like, just kind of looking at the thought and going like, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. <laughs> um, so, it just waited, there was a big truck that wanted to honk its horn. The truck says hello, everybody. I like how <laughs> somebody, so uh, a reader pointed here, and so they start up by saying, no need to read my name. Uh, because their name's in Japanese, and I think you would pronounce that Namushi, right? That's how I pronounce it. But I'd be curious um, if it's, um, I think, because usually, like a name like, if you, if you flip the characters around, wouldn't it be like Mugen? Um, Mu, yeah. You have to see, you can tell us how you would pronounce your name. Uh, but anyway, uh, name Noshi uh, says, but hey Mark, thanks for all your advice and genuine care. Oh, I appreciate it, thank you. Said, I feel like I'm struggling with, I need to get better and I really want to get better. So I'm making an effort to meditate, be mindful, and notice thoughts, and try to not judge them. I'm journaling my thoughts and doing mirror work too, but I don't know, sometimes I feel like I take one step forward and two steps back on some days, and two steps forward, one step back on other days. All my effort lately has been going to, I need to get better. But at the same time, I don't know what I should do to help myself if I don't meditate or be mindful and notice thoughts or cognitive diffusion. Yeah, so one thing uh, that can be so useful is because uh, what we're doing when we say, I need to get better, is essentially saying, like, I, I am contaminated and I need to clean myself. Uh, but then we're always just, like, we can never do enough, right? Because then we're, we just turn things like meditation and mental health work into these, like, special, special magic soaps. Where we're like, I'm going to find this special magic soap and this special cleaning technique and then I'm, I'm finally going to be clean. Uh, and But then, of course, we always have more problems to clean. There's always more contamination. It's never perfect enough. Instead, I'd be curious what you'd want to grow and create, especially if we said, look, you are 100% fully, completely recovered and done now. There's nothing else to clean. There's nothing to get better. So if you are not a problem to fix, say, it's solved, done what would you give your time and energy to in life? Because, uh, yeah, something like meditation, if we approach it with a fixing and a, what's called often in meditation a gaining idea, uh, then, yeah, the brain is just going to throw up more and more stuff for us to fix. And, and in many ways, you could say we're not even actually meditating because uh, meditation and mindfulness would be about like, having any experience without judgment. So if we're like, I'm, I have bad experiences and I have to clean them, we're already not meditating. We're already not in the kind of practice of mindfulness. Um, and so even, yeah, if you go on my Instagram channel, there, you just scroll down a bit, there's a certificate that I made. Uh, uh, it's, ve it's very like well-made, official looking certificate uh, to be recovered completely fully, 110% recovered. Um, so feel free to take a screenshot of that certificate so that you're recovered. There's nothing else to fix. And now that there's nothing else to fix, what do you want to grow in your life? What do you want to create? And the tools we pick up in like mental health and fitness can be about that. 
that's even that's why I like the idea of I call mental fitness because we're not we're not trying to fix a problem uh, we're not trying to fix an illness it's about what do we want to grow and we can just keep growing those capacities mm -hmm. Uh, and so, Sir Ahmed, uh, so you said, how can I get out from this trap? Uh, what to do? My religion is so important for me. Um, but then, and so you can see the way out of the trap. Then right after asking that question, you went right back to these cringeworthy thoughts, disrespect my religion. Uh, and like you just went back to giving more time and energy to the thoughts. So this switch, like so even just the switch that we've been talking about a lot today, uh, it's in our practices. So you see, so like if you look at the number of messages you shared hating on thoughts, and how many messages did you share about what you want to practice in your religion? Or how many messages did you share about what you love and care about in your religion? Uh, and not one, but you gave a lot of time and energy to the thoughts. And so what that tells the brain is like, okay, like the, the important thing must be these thoughts I'm throwing up. Because these are the things they give time and energy to. Uh, and so it's a shift that we have to make. So yeah, if your religion is important to you, uh, it's gonna be about giving time and energy to what's important to you and what you wanna grow in that spiritual practice rather than all this time and energy, like just rolling over the thoughts again and again. Oh, Velvet Adler, so following up yeah, our discussion earlier, uh, he said, I think kindness is so lovely and important to give to others. I definitely struggle with receiving it or giving it to myself. Yeah, we often do, right? And as, as we were talking about um, uh, what Ryan was asking about earlier, too, with receiving love. So, yeah, giving, giving love to yourself. Yeah, that idea of fan service. Can you be a fan of yourself this week? Um, and then, yeah, how do you want to let other people have the opportunity to be a fan of you? Enjoy it. Enjoy letting people be a fan of you, especially yourself. Inner city hoops. Yeah, I said I abstain from relationships because of it. A huge problem. Yeah. Giving ourselves those opportunities to, yeah, both give love, but also receive love. Carlo. Uh, he said, Carlo, he said, how are you? I just threw away one month of progress in a few days. So it's really neat, Carla, that there was never progress. Uh, this, and so what I mean by that is that all we ever have, so all, I say all I have now uh, is the choices I make in the next moment. That there's no, like I don't, I don't uh, do some kind of thing where I'm like, oh, like 13 years since I did that compulsion or something like that. Uh, no, there's only ever just right now. And that's amazing. I would say like such a fantastic way to actually sustain uh, great mental health and fitness, to sustain recovery, um, is to not see recovery as, I always describe it as this magic crystal piss pot. No, there's no magic crystal piss pot. There's just the choices we make in this next moment. That's all we ever have. Jake. Jakey said, I think you have never listened to Pulp. <laughs> Jake, I don't know if you missed earlier. Somebody asked how old I am. And I am, I'm 43 years old. So, of course, I've listened to Pulp. Shresha said, what if we are building our value? Let's say honesty. And so far, we've struggled with it and not been 100% su successful. And the brain starts taking that as bad, judging it and compulsively going back. Yeah, you see it there, right? Where at the moment we go like, I must be 100% perfect at something. It's the classic like contamination compulsion. I've got to be clean. Um, and so, yeah, instead seeing it as like, hey, no, like I would like to be honest. I would like to be myself. I would like to share the things I want to share. And yeah, in, in a moment, if we notice that we weren't, like, isn't it great that we can notice that? Like, that's such a wonderful self-awareness. And in the next moment, or the next opportunity we get, yeah, maybe we'll share something different. But again, that kindness to ourselves, so useful. Sir Abjad said, any advice on dealing with paranoia? For example, feelings like I'm being ignored, left out on purpose, etc. 
also how to overcome the feeling of not being good enough is to look at those things we want to give. Because uh, actually, yeah, especially when the brain, excuse me, goes like we are not good enough um, and it wants us to avoid something. That is such a wonderful opportunity where we can, um, the sun has moved a bit. The, um, where we can take action. And by taking action, that action, we show the brain uh, that, yeah, we can be ourselves in the world and we don't have to react to those fears. So I'd say with both of those, not seeing them as like different fears, right? The brain's gonna throw up an uncertainty to control, but instead of chasing that control, we can grow the things we wanna grow. PC, he said, how do I help my husband who has OCD and won't leave the house for fear of germs and getting COVID? Uh, so it's gonna be, uh, something that your husband is going to need to explore and change uh, as they want to, to work on these skills. Uh, so anytime a loved one wants to support a family member, the thing I always suggest to them is uh, to ask how somebody could get you to change something. Because uh, often then we recognize, yeah, it's, it's very difficult uh, for somebody to get us to uh, change something. It's going to be something that comes from with us but often through looking at how we would change things, we can also understand the supports that would be helpful. Jordan, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for joining the chat today. Erica. So can you explain what you mean when you say to ask ourselves, how do I do this well? I'm guessing you don't mean researching a topic to death <laughs> and ruminating about how to be good at it. Yes. Uh, no, it's great you brought this up, Erica. Yeah, because I could see how it, it would go that way. And so maybe um, pairing how to do it well with the idea of making things easy. Um, and so something I would come back to uh, is baking. Uh, since we were talking, yeah, baking about uh, apple pies. Uh, I, don't, I don't have access to an oven today, so I will not be able to bake my apple pie. Uh, I'll have to just hope somebody else baked it. But when they bake that apple pie, I bet they considered how to do it well. Um, and they probably learned that though, not from researching it, right? Because you could read every book on apple pies imaginable and you would know so much information about how to right and wrong things to do with apple pies. But baking an apple pie is a different experience, right? And all of the books you could read about apple pies, like actually I'm, I'm pretty high up in the Andes right now, I bet baking an apple pie here is very different from baking an apple pie down at sea level. And so if you read a whole bunch of books, you researched all about apple pies, but you didn't know that the people you were, who were writing those books about apple pies were down at sea level, all of that information you would feel like, oh, what, like, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? Uh, but actually you'd have to try and explore and experiment and bake more apple pies. Uh, and as you do that, yeah, you would pick up information about how you'd like to do that well. Uh, and, you know, taking on some of those pieces of information, but they, yeah, they would become like following a recipe. Uh, and yeah, at the same time, keeping it easy. Because of course we want apple pie, but if we make it this like big, intense, stressful experience to get it perfect, and we're probably not going to like it. We're probably not going to bake a lot of apple pies. Uh, so how can you give yourself some, yeah, some simple, easy values that you know are part of probably doing something well, uh, but then still there'll be many things that um, we don't know for certain. And so we take those steps forward, right? Like, like, with doing, like maybe we've really learned that uh, there's a particular topping on apple pie that we like. Uh, like I know some people are sharing some like delicious looking uh, berry crumbles on the discord server uh, Yeah, so we figure out like okay. Here's how I really like the topping This is I know how to do that well So I'm gonna I'm gonna make an apple pie with that kind of topping, but there's so many other things. I don't know I don't maybe I don't have access to the apples. I usually use maybe I'm using somebody else's oven I don't have the, the right kind of dish that I might normally use. I don't know how to do that part well uh, but so I'll try things and I'll learn but some things I do know how to do well so I'll, I will I will make sure I enjoy 
uh, a pie with the things I do know how to do well. Mm -hmm. So enjoy. Please uh, share uh, your apple baking, apple pie baking uh, adventures, real and metaphorical. Jordan said, I've been changing my beliefs through actions and also the idea of my brain being wrong. But too much of that seems to lead me to chasing a feeling of knowing the brain is working or checking. Uh, do you think there's a better way for me to practice this? As we explore uh, right changes, it, there is always this balance um, of like, just having kindness to ourselves and I would say curiosity. Uh, so that helped me a lot. Uh, kind of being curious about beliefs, uh, stepping into a situation, uh, doing something, and then afterwards, I was like, oh, look, maybe, maybe that uh, didn't go the way I wanted it to, or, oh, that's a really strange you know, thing I said or did in that uh, relationship or situation. Why did I do that? Or, like, maybe I avoided something around work, and after I'm like, oh, like, why did I avoid that? Or why did I do that that particular way? And that really becomes that opportunity to learn about our beliefs. Uh, and yeah, I may notice that, oh, okay, I have some kind of belief there that's not helpful to me. But if I then approach it as this like bad thing to clean away, it's putting a lot of pressure on myself. Um, and so yeah, at first, especially with beliefs, yeah, like we do change them and it is useful for us to change them. But really approaching that with kindness and curiosity um, and just like, isn't it so interesting that we have beliefs? Isn't it so interesting that they shape our actions? And that rather than putting that immediate pressure on like, ooh, like we're, we're like searching around for uh, illegal robots and if we find one, we're gonna throw it out of the spaceship. Like, no, like, we can be curious about it. Uh, so we can be curious about the monsters we discover. Oh, and Jordan, I see, yeah, you shared a donation down below. Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, always, yeah, thank you for being part of the community and joining us today. I appreciate it. David said, uh, do big changes in life, uh, can big changes in life make intrusive thoughts worse? Uh, how can we prepare toward those changes? Yes, 100%. Uh, so much of intrusive thoughts is just the brain's way of actually saying, hey, there's a big uncertainty over here. Help me to see it as kind of like a smoke detector. Intrusive thoughts are the brain saying, whoa, there's a big uncertainty that we don't control. Here, control this. Uh, and that's also why people will notice the brain will go back to old intrusive thoughts uh, when they say they do something new in life. Because the brain goes, whoa, I, like this new job, I do not understand at all. Or this event happening in the world, pff, I don't know what's going on here. But I do know we have a lot of experience like checking if we're real. So like, are you real? And it'll just go back to that old fear. Um, because it knows we'll try to control it. It might even go back to a fear you know is wrong. That's one of the brain's favorite things to do when we encounter new experiences. Uh, to be like, oh, are you a murderer? And we're like, no. And, but it's actually throwing that up because we know it's wrong. We immediately get some control. Uh, and so, yeah, really understanding that's just the brain's way of communicating. Yeah, it's not a good appliance. The brain is not, it's not even in the top five best organs. True, but this is just how it functions. So we can have, we can have a kindness towards this useless organ. Vegan knowledge. Yes. What is the best way to get rid of thoughts? Just sit with them and not put meaning with them? So I would say the best way to get rid of thoughts is to not want to get rid of them. If we're trying to get rid of thoughts, we're guaranteeing we're going to have a lot more of those thoughts. Ah, Jordan. And also, Jordan, you shared your latest video was my favorite yet. Uh, funny, but so helpful. Cool. Oh, that you only did it in one to two takes um, for a clip. Oh, thanks, Jordan. Thanks for watching it. Yeah, and that's, uh, that was something I was exploring. So 
talking about kind of my own practice uh, and having fun with uncertainty. Uh, the most recent video, the one on having panic attacks on a plane. Uh, and so, yeah, I was, I was sharing some kind of behind the scenes stuff on the subscription channel on Instagram. And I explained how I approached it was to only do it in one or two takes because uh, I want to start, I want to start making more videos. So I've been doing a video uh, a week this past month. And yeah, it was just a, it was a fun exercise to say like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, there were five points, uh, five tips in the video. And to just say to myself uh, and, and use it. And I, and I did that, okay, we're, we're only gonna do a second take if like I completely forgot what I was trying to say. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so even making space for like not maybe not mentioning a point that I, you know, wanted to mention. And so if I notice that later, just trusting and like, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll make another video just about that point or something like that. But uh, I shared what I wanted to share there and that's good enough. And let's get it to people. So having that focus on sharing it with people rather than I've got to get this right in some way. Uh, and so, yeah, and then it helps, right, create more and move more quickly, but it's also a great uh, practice for handling the brain. Oh, and so thank you, uh, Nanashi, for explaining. It's pronounced Nanashi. Yep. It's good to know how to pronounce that. Thank you. Oh, and Nanashi yeah, said, thank you so much. I'll definitely check out the certificate and work on what I want to grow instead of fix instead. Enjoy that. Farzan, you said, do you have any thoughts on OCD, PTSD, and compulsive looking? I know for a fact by experiencing this myself, they go hand in hand. Any thoughts? Yeah, the only thing I would say that, yeah, Farzan, I wouldn't separate those two. Um, yeah natural to if we've had some traumatic experience that then we're going to want to control that uncertainty in the present and we may do compulsions like constantly checking and looking right checking for reassurance that something is safe uh yeah it could yeah it could really help to see this as all together but then too the more we do those checking compulsions the more we're telling the brain we're still in danger um, and so yeah it could be really useful to explore cutting out the compulsions Vessel, hello. Jordan, so when you were leaving mental illness behind, did it take a long time for you to want to have any thought? Uh, I'm definitely improving with this, but still react to some thoughts. Yeah, and so absolutely. And even what you explained there, Jordan, is, like, is one of those neat things. Like I would still, I still find really helpful uh, if I notice uh, you know, I notice some frustration or getting annoyed with something. Uh, I find it so helpful to kind of notice my brain there, kind of give it a hug, kind of pat it on the head like it's a pet, and just notice like, oh yeah, Brent, like you really want to control that, or you really want to get rid of that. Um, and so again, yeah, that that curiosity and kindness, like when we can look at that uh, urge to get rid of a thought with kindness. Like that can often be the way through it. Um, that can be a way to soften having it, uh, like to be to wonder at that. Like, oh, isn't it? Of, of course, I don't want to have that thought. Isn't that so? Yeah, like interesting that I want to get rid of that. Uh, and yeah, just like seeing like with a pet. Um, like, have you ever seen um, how like some pets are scared of kind of random things, uh, and being able to? Because yeah, we can tell the pet like, oh, it's. It's just a stick, it's not a snake. But like the, you know, we'll see like a cat, like just terrified of a stick or a cucumber. And yeah, we can tell it, you know, don't, don't be afraid, it's just a vegetable. Uh, but also, yeah, we can understand why it hates on that. Um, and we can give that same kind of curious compassion to ourselves. QA Elzo said, uh, yeah, thank you so much for your work. Oh, I appreciate it. 
Oh, I love your videos. Thank you for all the help. Oh, QA so thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. I'm glad they've been useful. Sharesha said, I would love to know about ways in which we can practice self-compassion when for years we've judged our experience and ourselves harshly. Yeah, so Sharesha, um, and then yes, you also, also if you could share how was your recovery journey. Uh, so I, that, uh, I have many videos on that. You can check out any of the videos on, on my YouTube channel to learn more about that. Uh, there's even a video that's very specifically on compulsions I had, which I think is called A Human Brain. I think, um, but yeah, there is a video that's kind of more specifically on that. Um, or w a great video, actually, if you want to know what a recovery journey looks like, there is um, an hour long video. Actually, it might be, actually, no, I think it's like two hours long uh, called The Geography of Recovery. And that's uh, in my channel. And then on compassion, yeah, actually the skill I was just sharing in response to Jordan's question there. It'd be great to explore. Brenda said, I'm in university right now, and I'm very scared of teachers. The massive amount of work that I have and doing something wrong. I wish I could enjoy it, but I'm terrified of it. Uh, do you have any tips for dealing with stress during school? Looking at what you want to grow and create in school uh, can be a help. So it is about right, something you're proactively wanting to move towards rather than um, you know, a fear, needing to control a fear around like professors or something like that. Um, talking to your professors about that, uh, they'll, they'll really, they'll understand that and they might have some uh, useful insights uh, to share around handling that. Uh, but also understanding if you're putting pressure on yourself to like get something perfect, uh, maybe looking at where that pressure is coming from. Because, yeah, if you're just like if anything else, we were trying to like clean something perfectly, that's uh, going to create a lot of struggle. Vessel said, yesterday I suddenly forgot where I'd parked my car. This triggered obsessions about me having my mom's brain disease, which could be the case. Now I'm constantly checking if I'm forgetting stuff. Vessel, any tips? Well, Vessel, you can see with compassion where that fear comes from. Uh, when you see now I'm constantly checking if I'm forgetting stuff, uh, a key thing though is that that's going to make you uh, forget stuff. Uh, so uh, on my own adventures, and this can be fun to explore, uh, I noticed that I, because I was constantly checking things or because I was constantly redoing things, rewriting things, uh, this is one of the reasons why I practiced just doing videos in one or two takes the other day, is because I noticed that and because our brains love compulsions and the brain's also in charge of, uh, you know, handing us memories and things like that when we want them, that it seems to have an incredible capacity to forget things if we'll do compulsions around forgetting things. So yeah, that more checking you're doing to make sure you're not forgetting things, I would see it as a big risk factor for forgetting things. Um, and so like an exercise I practiced around this for instance, uh, if there was just any kind of number I needed to remember, like a password code or something like that, I just started to practice uh, not checking it multiple times. I'm going to read it once. I'm going to input it. Um, writing things, not like going back, rereading, re rewriting, all of that kind of stuff. You know, writing things once, doing videos once, things like that. Uh, yeah, and not checking. Right, the brain's always going to go. Ah, yeah, you don't know if you. Uh, remember where you parked or you locked that door, you turned off the stove, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the more we check, the more we'll forget. So, how do you want to practice giving yourself trust? Silva said, not sure how to do ERP. Should I just do it for one theme and keep doing the compulsions for other harder themes till it is their turn on the ERP list? Uh, yeah, so it can be fun to um, grab a good book. Uh, I lay out in like my book, like You Are Not a Rock, The Mind Workout, a plan for doing ERP exercises. You could work with somebody. There's all sorts of ways to, to approach ERP. You're not gonna get it right. Like a lot of it's gonna be about like trying things. So see, see what works well for you. Um, yeah, you may try one approach and see, oh, I just ended up doing a whole bunch of compulsions and practicing things more. Okay, that approach doesn't really work well for me. I'm gonna try a different approach.
Oh, Dom, you said, my belief is I need love before I do anything. Well, the great thing is that, um, so one, that's not true. Uh, but secondly, you can also just give yourself that love. Uh, Mike, he said, what do you do if you have literally no interest in anything? Mm, but who said you would have interest in anything? Or who said you need interest to go and do stuff? Um, so actually, yeah, just like the, the question above you, you're creating this like prerequisite. It's like saying, I need a feeling of effervescence before I go and live my life. And then we end up constantly checking for the feeling of effervescence. And then we're like, oh, I don't feel effervescent enough to live my life today. Uh, and then we don't. And so, yeah, like that whole framework is so much of what mental health struggles rely on, right? Like even somebody who like wants to feel safe before they leave their house. They're going to do more and more checking to feel safe and they are not going to feel safe. And they can say, oh, how do you leave your house when you literally do not feel safe? Uh, but that feeling of not being safe or that feeling of being contaminated, etc., comes from all those compulsions to get the feeling. Uh, but actually, yeah, getting that feeling, like following that, that formula, was not something we need to do. Vegan knowledge. He said, do you know why it can be easy to just go about my business and ignore compulsions? And then it seems to revisit me. Uh, is that because the brain is fighting the healing? Oh, no, I wouldn't see it as like the brain like fighting anything. Uh, part of it's just the human experience. So one of the things we're often doing is trying to hold perfectly to some kind of like recovered, healthy feeling. But that is the same logic that makes us afraid of something like not recovering. Or like, oh, I'll, I'll be stuck with depression forever. Uh, and so what I'd look at from both a positive and negative angle is how we're trying to hold on to perfect feelings. How we're trying to make feelings permanent. Uh, because when we're doing that around something we judge as positive, like recovery, then of course we're also going to be afraid of it around uh, something that we uh, dislike as well. Uh, but yeah, the reality of the human experience uh, is that uh, our feelings are constantly changing. Our experience is constantly changing. Our capacity to do things, constantly changing. Just like nature, things are always different and moving and transforming. And so we can embrace that. Uh, 2045-34, Danush, you said, are you taking medication for OCD? No, I, uh, I did not take medication uh, when I had OCD. I do not uh, take any uh, medication now. Alberto, thank you. Mad Salama, thanks for joining us. These live streams are always helpful and I'm so grateful for that and being part of this community. Thank you for being part of the community and joining us today. You got a like, little heart there, thank you. And then 2045, yeah, you said, do, do, does cutting compulsions stop OCD? Yeah, it helped me see, like there is no OCD without the compulsions outside of our heads and inside of our heads. Silva said, is it possible to have OCD around mental health, ADHD, schizophrenia, BPD? How to deal with it? I feel OCD mimics disorder as the themes change. Well, no, so it's, uh, yeah, it can really help to see it in the context. I don't know if you caught it. I was talking about this earlier. Like we're just checking on the bad thing. And so whatever that bad thing is, so like whatever we label as bad, and then we start, okay, I've got to make sure the bad thing doesn't happen. And so that bad thing could be, one day it could be a car accident. Another day it could be uh, uh, our part, us, us lying to somebody or our partner cheating on us. The next day it could be, oh no, what if I have uh, some kind of physical disease? What if I have some kind of uh, psychiatric disease, etc.? So seeing it is just that, what if this bad thing happens? And then us going, I've got to have certainty about that bad thing. And then of course, the more we chase that certainty, the more we'll be convinced that the bad thing is happening. Oh, Brenda, I hope you have a nice day too. And Vessel, you as well. Dawn, yeah, you're welcome. Have a great day. Jisha, yeah, you said, if I decide for three hours for work, but when I'm not able to complete it, I don't know if I'm trying to be perfect or I'm not practicing enough acceptance and moving through it, what would be helpful? Yeah, why, why is it a problem? King Kirby, thanks for stopping by. Oh, King Kirby, I don't know if, Wally, I don't know if I knew that you were King Kirby. 
Thanks for explaining that. I, I think I knew that in the past, but I had forgot when I saw that just now. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. And Ryan, oh, thank you. I know, everybody, we've gone past two hours today. I want to thank you, everybody, for joining and hanging out. We will wrap up soon. I think I'm slowly, slowly catching up. Maybe. Possibly. <laughs> oh, no, I have. I've actually come to the end. And Milani, you said, can OC affect our functioning during the day? Having trouble going to the gym, cooking, keeping up with tasks, and suddenly I get themes related to this ADHD, depression. Yeah, so, no, Milani, yes, yeah, so you asked about the depression earlier, but again, see, that's, OC isn't a thing that affects stuff. What you're describing there are the compulsions, right? Where we, instead of going to the gym, or instead of cooking, because uh, like those are things we would, that would nourish us, we react to the thoughts, right? We go and spend our time and energy on a bunch of compulsions or chasing some certainty about a fear rather than doing what would actually nourish us. And so really seeing it's like these things are practices. And so, yeah, uh, it's, not, it's not OCD affecting us. It's us uh, doing things which, yeah, we could then label as OCD. Uh, but yeah, it can really help if you want to build mental health skills uh, you want to improve mental fitness to see, oh no, those are, those are things we can do differently. And with that, everybody, I'm going to go finish my uh, fruit smoothie and uh, have some more breakfast. Oh, Velvet Adley said, thanks for your videos. I hope you have a nice rest of your day. Velvet Adley, thank you. I hope you have a great day too. I hope everybody uh, enjoys getting your week started um, and really... Yeah, enjoying doing the things you want to do this week. And hopefully one of those things you want to do is give a lot of kindness and compassion and curiosity to yourself, right? That kept coming up a lot today, right? That, yeah, there's all these things we want to do right and we can even approach like mental health as like a thing we want to do right. Yeah, but what if, what if we don't have to do it right? What if we can be curious about this amazing human experience and then through that curiosity, we can start to learn yeah, how we may want to do some things differently. John, <laughs> John thanks for joining us. Thanks for appreciating, appreciating my head. I actually, I had a sunburn on this side of my head the other day. I didn't notice because I was up in the mountains and it wasn't sunny, but just even a little bit of time when you're really high up, even like no direct sun. Oh, I, I got a bit of sunburn. So is is healing this morning. Lorenzo, he said, I was told that people with OCD have parts of the brain that work differently. Is that true? Uh, so I don't get caught up in like because even that idea, like that people have that differently from what. Uh, also, yeah, like, if somebody practices something consistently, like, of course they have something different in their head. Uh, like, if you play the piano every day uh, for a year, well, who knows, especially you play the piano every day for 10 years, like, wouldn't you expect something to be a little different in the, the head of the person who plays the piano versus somebody uh, who, for instance, uh, drives taxi every day? Uh, they're probably tapping into different parts of the brain, just like we would expect somebody who does weightlifting every day. If we then, you know, did a scan of their body, we'd probably find some things that are different from somebody who practices video games every day. Uh, but that doesn't mean that those differences cause them to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, like getting caught up in like, especially, and that's actually a problem with any study that, take somebody who's diagnosed with something and then says, oh, look, this person diagnosed with something is different from somebody not diagnosed with it. Uh, but we don't know, like the people in the control group, they could all get diagnosed with it next week. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really tell us anything. And so there are not causative studies like that say like, oh, if somebody has this thing in their brain, that's going to lead to this other thing. Uh, when it comes to something like mental illness. Uh, so yeah, I, yeah, it's not something I'd find useful. At the same time, like 
you know, we talk about this all the time. I, I was talking about it today. Like, it really helps me to see my brain does things. I don't know that I would say that means my brain is different, but I've learned how to handle what my brain does. Uh, so whatever my brain's going to do, I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to be kind to it. And I'm going to give my time and energy to the things I want to do. And so let's, we can all do that this week. Let's do that today. Thank you so much, everybody, for dropping on by. I appreciate it. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, a wonderful community. Thank you to everybody uh, who donated today. Uh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, Michael and Jordan, uh, Kimberly and Ryan. Uh, I, I hope I, I just got everybody. If I didn't get somebody who also donated, I appreciated that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for also, like sharing your questions, um, everybody, and your insights today. Uh, it's really, yeah, it's really wonderful that we can connect around these practices of having human brains and living our lives. So yeah, please do enjoy that this week. Uh, having a brain. Hmm? Maybe it's different uh, than somebody else's brain. And that's a pretty amazing thing. And so let's go bake some apple pies. <laughs>